I don't think I've ever sat down with a movie and had my entire perception of it change to the extent that I have with the original Sam Raimi Spider-Man. Some context. The last time I sat down with this from beginning to end prior to writing this review was I don't even know how many years ago. Out of every Spider-Man movie, it's the one I've seen in its entirety the least. The intervening years have been spent hearing people either sing its praises or make fun of it, and so I've spent lordy knows how long with this movie cordoned off into the back of my mind as essentially a B-minus level great for the time but really nothing compared to its more modern polished followers type flick. I've always thought of it as the worst, or at least most forgettable, of the three Raimi movies, and I was honestly comfortable never going back to it after absorbing years and years of what I found to be the superior Spider-Man material. HA! <laughs> and now I just wanna slap myself because this movie not only holds up, I wouldn't be remotely surprised if it holds up the best out of any movie in this whole retrospective. Now, I know I'm gonna have to do a bit of convincing, considering that I'm by no means the only person that has accused this movie's most devoted fans of being nostalgia-blind, and certain parts of the film have, I think unfairly, been made into easy butts of jokes over the decade and a half since its release. I say unfairly because I went into this film inundated with the idea of the lead performances, Tobey Maguire's facial expressions, the not-all-there CG, and the script by David Kep as easy targets. And I gotta say, rarely if ever did any of these things impede the movie's ability to resonate with me. Wait, what? A cheeseburger in this movie costs $7.84? Instantly dated, can't get invested, this is a fantasy! Okay, okay, I should structure this a little bit. Tell you what, I'm just gonna go broad strokes in something that I hope resembles a chronological order by the end and see how that goes. Cool? Cool. New territory for all of us. For starters, this movie does a really good job establishing who Peter Parker is in a really short time before the spider bite. It happens less than 10 minutes into the film, not counting opening credits, and although he's pretty broadly drawn in those 10 minutes, I have a good sense of what kind of guy this is, so the changes he undergoes have real weight despite how fast they pop up. I'm on record now calling Tom Holland my definitive live-action Peter, and I stand by that, but Toby's take in the earliest stretch of the film does just as good a job playing naively geeky put-upon kid, despite whatever comments you might want to make about age. Ditto is cohorts. Mary Jane and Harry Osborn both exude youth visibly caving under social pressures, either manifesting in or resulting from performative vapidness or detached, sheltered slackerness, respectively. Even with Kirsten Dunst and James Franco not looking exactly like any high school grads I've ever seen. Although if I can get really, really shallow for just a second, I don't think Dunst has ever looked better than in this movie. These three characters are all effective foils for each other and just how defined they are by their own baggage and not quite healthy or normal approach to social interaction. And I like how obvious that is from their very first scenes together. Peter and Harry clearly don't share any interests, Harry tries to pretend to be someone he isn't to impress MJ, MJ is self-consciously worried about her image when Peter decides to photograph her, and Peter himself is shy and monosyllabic to the point of almost creepiness. It's a nice interplay between the three of them and a great establishing moment for the three most important people in this trilogy. Although the scene also introduces a less impressively written character in the form of Flash. Flash is an extremely lazy archetype, and it's honestly a wonder that his presence doesn't bother me more than it does. He's not a main character, but he's important enough that I feel like I should have a clue as to why he is the way he is, even a subtle one. He affects the other characters too much for me to just accept him as just a narrative device instead of a person, I guess. Maybe it's a generational thing. I went to high school in the generation after this movie, and let me tell you, super arbitrarily violent meatheads who manage to have tons of friends and nice things don't actually exist in my experience. The rest of the movie is above having this character in it, is what I'm saying. Now, I used to feel the same way about Peter himself, seeing him as just an archetype of a 90s movie nerd both before and after the power set in, and while I will now freely admit that this movie gives us a fully realized three-dimensional character, there are still aspects of his characterization toward the beginning that ring false to me. Sometimes, Peter's super sappy, second-hand embarrassment-inducing dorkiness plays true to life, like him getting hung up on Bruce Campbell announcing his name wrong, or whenever he and MJ have an actual conversation. Other times, though, like when he monologues a conversation with her to himself, or freezes up completely with her in the lunchroom, are just creepy and weird in a bad way. I know it's a big world, and there are all kinds of people like this out there, but it's just a smidge too pathetic for my perception of Peter Parker. Not that I have a problem with Peter and MJ suffering from a disconnect, far from it. I think that's what the best parts of this movie are about. 
Peter and MJ's relationship, along with other aspects of the movie that we'll get into in a bit, is all about the pretenses they put on around or for each other, and how they refuse to let each other see themselves for who they really are if they can help it. I'll expand on this more as we go, but needless to say, Harry and his father Norman will factor into this theme as well. Everyone here is wearing a metaphorical mask. As an example of my point, I like that Peter's desire for a car, and by extension the murder of Uncle Ben, comes not just from a desire to impress MJ, but from fundamentally misunderstanding her. Although it should be obvious to the audience, Peter never quite puts it together that Mary Jane's impressed attitude with Flash's car, indeed her entire relationship with Flash, is entirely performative. Ironic is that this comes directly after Peter himself gives us the first mention of Mary Jane's affinity for acting, and yet he can't tell that's exactly what she's doing, and that his quest for a fancy car would only ever impress the fake MJ that the rest of the world sees. Peter, through sheer vicinity, is the only person who gets a glimpse of the real MJ and her real life through hearing her and her father fight, but he can't tell the difference between the real girl and the mask just yet. Combine this with the already selfish and petty mistake of letting Uncle Ben's killer go initially over a slight, and what we have with Peter is a truly three-dimensional guy whose various imperfections and misconceptions work well to counterbalance how much of an almost cartoon-level weenie he can be in other scenes. Something I really like about that fact, in keeping with the motif of masks, is how the first instances of franchise staples like the web swinging or the hanging upside down, etc., happens in such a sinister and dark context. Probably the darkest that the whole movie gets, and I don't just mean the lighting. Peter chasing down Uncle Ben's killer is the first real action scene in the film, and it plays almost scarier than anything the villain does. It's a constant reminder looking back of the real potential for someone like Jonah Jameson to be right about Spidey as a menace. This is a kid, and he's just been given more than enough power so that the long-term consequences of his innocent whims or flights of fancy make him genuinely scary. Made more poignant by the fact that this is the one action scene where he's not wearing the deliberately scary bug-eye mask. Well, I say only, but we'll get to that in a minute. The mask here reveals his eyes, and by the very end, when Peter's snapping arms and unintentionally causing death, the mask is all the way off. There's no artifice here. This is who Peter Parker is, or at least has the potential to be, and it's a dangerous, frightening creature of revenge. It's the mask slipping off in the worst way possible, and I imagine Peter is eternally grateful that no one is here to see it. I love that such a heroic, jokey character starts from such a dark place. And on that note, let me just say right now for posterity, anyone, including myself who's ever accused this movie's version of Spidey of not being quippy or talkative enough, was talking out of their rear ends. Not only is Spidey relatively faithful in the snark department, it's real easy to see that charisma, or at the very least that sense of humor, struggling to get out when Peter is out of costume. And man, do I come out of this movie with a bigger appreciation than ever before of Maguire's layered human performance. Also, hey, if I can go on a bit of a tangent, the wrestling scene confuses me. So clearly this is like WWE-style fakey wrestling, right? With the over-the-top beefcake characters and the smack-talking groupies, the hammy referee, etc. And clearly these guys all know that Peter is a kid, or at least a young guy based on their comments. But then I guess not, because these same ladies hand Bonesaw McGraw real metal chairs and a freaking crowbar for him to repeatedly bash Peter over the head with. You know, what if Peter wasn't lucky enough to have freaking spider powers, and this was just some random scrawny kid they let sign up for a fight? He would be concussed, or maybe even dead by the third hit with that chair. And I'm supposed to believe that everyone here is fine with that. Heck, that probably means that guy from the start of the fight really did have his legs broken. That's just too much, it's too much! That almost breaks this entire setting, to think that this many people in this movie's reality would be this psychopathically blood-hungry. I honestly feel like the movie does a pretty decent job at letting you know what kind of world this is outside of this scene, but for the tone and feel of the world to go from broad and heightened to cartoon during this one sequence creates some serious dissonance. Getting back to the motif of the mask and how it informs Peter and MJ's relationship, the second fight scene to not feature the mask is when Peter saves her from an assault, and by extension this movie from an R rating. This takes place after Peter has had some time to let the illusory version of MJ he had in his head dissipate a little. She's caught in a lie about where she works, and the key to keeping Peter sympathetic to the audience is that he remains sympathetic toward her. Peter has a better idea of who MJ is without her figurative mask, but he refuses to let her see him without his. MJ and Peter finally connect when his mask is half off, and importantly, it's him trusting her to take it off partially. Both of these characters are reluctant to let their real identities be known to each other, but it's only in taking steps to do so that they get closer together. 
As if to make my job easy, we have this line from Aunt May later in the film. She doesn't really know who I am. Because you won't let her. You're so mysterious all the time. While I'm talking about her, I suppose I should mention that I do find Aunt May to be another aspect of this particular film that's just kinda... okay. She's there because it only makes sense that she would be, and to serve as a target for the Goblin, and to give Peter thematically relevant pick-me-up speeches like this one. But I do gotta say, it feels surprisingly easy to forget she's in this movie, which is unfortunately a pretty standard side effect of being Aunt May. I don't think there's any existing take on this character that really comes alive in the same way the mythos around her does, so I hesitate to hold it against this film, though I'll say right now most of what I remember from her comes from the second and third movies. As far as characters exclusive to this film, and more evidence to the mask motif, Norman Osborn as a villain is yet another mixed bag. He's the only other character literally wearing a mask besides Peter, and like the kids, he's got a part of himself he's making the conscious decision to hide away. Yes, of course I mean the psychotic Jekyll Hyde thing he's got going for him, but more subtly, Norman strikes me as a guy obsessed with hiding any weaknesses. In fairness, it's hard to tell how much of this is the performance enhancers screwing around with his normal personality, since the movie plays it a bit ambiguous whether it's a clean psychological split between Norman and the Goblin, or if some of Norman's more emotional outbursts aren't really how he'd act without the Goblin in him. I like to think that the one reference we get to Harry's mother really is Norman letting slip just how much her abandonment wounded him, even if he wraps it up in mean-spirited comments about MJ. Even when it seems like he's trying very sincerely to apologize to Harry for being distant and pressuring him, there's a sense that Norman can't quite be as frank as he'd like to be emotionally. If we take the Goblin persona as the manifestation of Norman's mask which, like Peter's, brings qualities already inherent to the fore, then it's telling that both he and Peter have their lives consumed by them at the end. It's a tragedy for them both. Peter may not have literally lost his life to his own mask the way Norman did, but given that his journey throughout the movie has been toward earning Mary Jane's heart through authenticity, it's tragic that all four of our main characters lose the opportunity to be loved because Norman and Peter just couldn't make the choice to stop being Goblin and Spidey. Thematically, the Goblin works perfectly. My main problem with Norman is when I just can't keep track of what the Goblin even wants from scene to scene. I get that the Goblin personality is animalistic and primal, but I don't know what he means when he says he wants more power. Even if it made sense, it's exceptionally shallow and baseless as far as villain motivations go. The aspect of it that I like is that he grows a personal vendetta with Peter upon being rejected, then finding out his identity, reflecting Peter's own initial desire for similar retribution which got his uncle killed. As a dark mirror for Peter's own character flaws, acting rashly and over-emotionally, Norman is interesting enough. What I don't like about it is just how aimless it all feels. The Goblin starts off getting retribution for slights on Norman, then just kinda generically wants power, and then fixates on Spider-Man for slighting him, and it all feels like the movie is struggling to give him reasons to do things past a certain point. It doesn't come close to breaking the film, but it is distracting. What I like about the character beyond Willem Dafoe's show-stealing performance is how he works to elevate the themes and feel of the story. Like I said, his mirroring of Peter works, and if nothing else, his debatably petty and scattered motivations do serve to keep the narrative personal. The biggest Gobby and Spidey's conflict gets in terms of scale is when that bus full of kids gets involved, and even then, Goblin's immediate goal is as simple as making Peter regret the personal betrayal. It's a unique approach to a hero-villain conflict in one of these movies, and I just wish we hadn't convoluted it by having Goblin make all this kinda arbitrary, speechifying about social Darwinism and the futility of heroism that doesn't seem to come from or go anywhere. Come film's end, even as Peter rejects MJ romantically and chooses to remain fundamentally inauthentic with her, the two of them have a far greater understanding of each other than they ever did, especially with the implication that MJ put together that Pete and Spidey are one and the same based off their kisses. The masks, for the most part, are now gone for both of them, and the window of hope that they could make it work now that they truly know each other is left open. I've gotta tell you, man, I had such a radically different experience watching this movie for review than the other times I've seen it, it's almost scary. The action, the humor, the emotional beats, the pace, it all just resonated with me so much harder than ever before. For a while now, I've defined my collective perception of the Raimi Spider-Man movies with phrases like hasn't aged well, poor characterization, etc. But man, I never thought that sitting down and watching this first film again would essentially put me in the movie bob camp of calling it an unassailable classic. I've spent the last couple of years viewing anyone who would describe this movie in such a way as incredibly biased in favor of nostalgia. 
Honestly, I went into this viewing wanting these feelings validated and grasping for any flaws I could find initially. But on its own merits, the film won me over. This really is a great movie.